the title of my presentation today is CE9, the Essene Angel ET Disclosure, with the further subtitle, Close Encounters of the Ninth Kind and the Science of Ascension. That's a mouthful. I realize that. And there's a lot of layers to what we're going to be talking about in the next hour to hour and a half that we have together. The presentation I'm giving you today is based on, as Jonah said in my introduction, over 20 years of research. I've been focusing on the Gnostic wisdom traditions. And over the years, I haven't spent enough time researching the Essenes. The Essenes were a group of primarily Jewish mystics who were living in Jerusalem and also Alexandria, Egypt, in the period from 150 BC to approximately 70 AD. They were known as some of the most elite scholars of their time. They were deeply interested in a singular subject, and that was how can humans transform into celestial beings or angels. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably. There, the documentation about the Essene belief in human transformation is found in what is known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, a cache of documents that was discovered quite serendipitously in 1947. Virtually from the moment the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, they were controversial because the moment scholars began peeling away the, the layers of the Essene teachings, they realized that Christianity in its earliest and most primitive form was based on the teachings of the Essenes. And this, as we're going to explore here in a moment, was enormously controversial at the, at the time because the ET disclosure movement was just beginning to accelerate in the, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And when you have a cache of documents that comes along and says that the family of Jesus, who we are talking about here, were interacting with extraterrestrial beings, th that's really red hot type of information. But these scrolls affirm, and we'll, we're going to discuss them as we continue, that the Essenes were not just talking about making contact with angelic beings. They were living with them. These celestial beings had come down from the heavenly realms and were communing, living with the Essenes. And not only that, they were taking humans into the celestial realms and transforming them into angelic beings. Now, in the vernacular of Dr. J. Allen Hynek, this is describing not only close encounters of the first, second, and third kind, they're not just seeing angelic beings here in heavenly spaces. They are making contact with these beings. These beings are living with them, teaching them, which is a close encounter of the fifth, sixth, and seventh kind, and also assisting humans in transforming themselves into celestial beings or angels. That's a close encounter of the ninth kind. And what we see in the Dead Sea Scrolls is an assimilation of the ancient secret practice of ascension, which was actually begun several hundred years before their time in Babylon under the watchful eye of the watcher angels that many of you know better as the Anunnaki. So what I'm saying to you, and we'll demonstrate as we continue, is that actually the Anunnaki were living with the Essenes in Qumran. And that is just enormous, has enormous implications for Christianity, as I said. We're looking here at a 1955 painting by Salvador Dali of The Last Supper. In my opinion, it's perhaps the most extraordinary depiction of The Last Supper. Leonardo da Vinci's is very famous, but it's mundane in its setting and its iconography. Dolly's painting is loaded with esoteric knowledge. To begin, we see Jesus not in a fully physical form. He's in an interphasic state. He's neither fully flesh and blood nor fully in his celestial body which Christianity calls the resurrection body, the glory body, the perfect body, or the light body. 
if we look at this detailed image, we look at Jesus's arm and he's got this plasma field around his body, rainbow-like. This, in my opinion, matches perfectly with what the Tibetans refer to as the rainbow body of light. For the past 1,200 years, the Tibetans have taught the spiritual teaching that is far, far older than that, that the human body was designed to have its frequency accelerated so that it could be spun into a vortex of energy that ultimately manifests as five color rainbow light, the rainbow body, leaving behind only hair, toe, and fingernails, which have no nerves to be transmuted. This rainbow body I propose and submit to you is the primor primary or primordial celestial form of the angelic beings. And what the Tibetans teach is that once the Lama, the spiritual master, has achieved the rainbow body, they have the ability to phase back and forth between the physical body and the immaterial celestial body. So by linking the Tibetan teaching with that of Jesus, we have put together an extremely important piece of information. I am the first researcher scholar to identify in the Dead Sea Scrolls the Essene belief and understanding of how the human body is transmuted into light. And I propose that this is what the, the most closely guarded secret of the Essenes and was ultimately taught to Jesus as a young man. And in his resurrection, he demonstrated his understanding of this secret practice. Now, the amazing thing to me about the rainbow body teaching is that according to the Tibetans, this teaching did not originate, it, originate on earth. It is an extraterrestrial teaching that is taught in 13 star systems, including our own. In my research, that list of star systems includes Sol, which is the name of our star system, Sirius, Orion, the Pleiades, Cygnus, Lyra, Vega, Arcturus, and Ursa Major. So if we count those, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine star systems. These are the star systems that appear repeatedly in sacred myth and, and tradition going back 5,000 years. The Tibetans are saying there's four other star systems, and they infer in this teaching that all of these star systems are connected. My research reveals they're connected by a system of stargates and portals that are accessed via, via the beings in their rainbow bodies. So what I'm showing you here is the Tibetan version of the celestial beings. This is how they believe they, they appear in their fully manifested rainbow light bodies. We cross back over to Christianity and we see Jesus enthroned in the same rainbow ring. We see various figures wearing white robes. These are perfected humans, angelic humans who live in the celestial realms. These are the Essenes who have completed the earthly cycle of spiritual evolution and have fully manifested their light body or their rainbow body and have now ascended to the celestial realm. I don't know how much of this Salvador Dali actually knew. Some would argue that he knew a lot about what I'm describing here. Let's take a look at the painting in just a little bit more detail to see what he actually did reveal. The room in which the disciples are gathered with Jesus for the Last Supper, many of these disciples are Essenes, John the Beloved, John the Baptist. Uh, others are notably Essenes. They're pictured in a 12-sided dodecahedron, which can be perceived by observing the pentagonal windows, which are open, that surround the table. The dodecahedron is actually a shape that Plato spoke of several hundred years before the Essenes came on the picture. He said it was the shape of the whole universe. The Essenes in, in 150 BC were students of Plato's works from, as I said, several hundred years before. In his discourse, Phaedo, Plato 
records the astonishing revelation of Socrates in the last moments before his execution, that the true earth itself looks from above, if you could see it, like those 12 patched leather balls. So Socrates is telling Plato, I, I have been outside of the atmosphere of earth. I've been in space. And if you could see the true earth, it looks like one of those 12 patched leather balls of dodecahedra. The dodecahedron with 12 five-sided faces was in fact used as a teaching tool to instruct the platonic initiate to know himself or herself as an energy system just like the earth. The takeaway here is that as we view our physical earth, we're being asked to superimpose a matrix, a, another structure, a spiritual structure, the dodecahedron, on this with 12 vertices or points. These are actually thought of as portals in this tradition, portals through which the soul comes and goes. Here in, in this detail of Raphael's painting, we see Leonardo as Plato. And remarkably, Plato is describing Earth as a three-dimensional pentagonal web into which our soul incarnates, takes on this physical form, and then must ascend from. Plato likely learned this from Egypt. The ancient Egyptians were well-versed in the knowledge that the human body is ideally structured geometrically to interface with the dodecahedron and its pentagonal grid. Leonardo encapsulated this idea in his famous painting the, or drawing the Vitruvian Man. Dali himself, though, gives us a perspective on why he chose to use this 12-sided shape. He says, contrary to the anecdotal and obscure conceptions and paintings, <clears throat> excuse me, on this same subject, I wanted to materialize the maximum luminous and Pythagorean instantaneousness based on the celestial communion of the number 12, 12 hours of the day, 12 months, 12 pentagons, 12 signs, 12 apostles of Christ, so forth. The, the big flashing word in this uh, statement to me is that he wanted to maximize or the, the maximum of luminous and Pythagorean instantaneousness. This is important in a discussion about the Essenes because this, in addition to being students of Plato, the Essenes were also students of Pythagoras. Pythagoras was taught by his adopted brother, Astraeus, who was adopted by Pythagoras' father and who was claimed to be a star child, who instructed Pythagoras in the secrets of the universe. In 1955, Salvador Dali, along with the rest of the world, were just learning from the newly discovered Dead Sea Scrolls that the Essenes, who, as I say, were students of both Pythagoras and Plato, predicted or planned for the emergence of a 12-gated celestial city called the New Jerusalem or Sion that would come out of the sky. So here's Dolly painting the Last Supper with this 12-gated dodecahedron at the Last Supper, which is, in my opinion, quite profound, whether he intuited this or knew of the significance of this. This Last Supper is the moment when Jesus transmits to the disciples the power of resurrection into a celestial being. He literally exudes this to his disciples, and it transforms them. And this teaching about the 12-gated celestial city is at the apex of all of this, because when you're talking about ascension, people want to know, well, where are you going to ascend to? And the answer from the Essenes point of view is you're going to the New Jerusalem, this 12 gated city that they suggested in the Dead Sea Scrolls is parked just above Earth, especially Jerusalem. The Essene ascension teachings were then focused on human transformation into ephemeral light beings like the angels who dwelled in this celestial city and who came down from the celestial city to teach the Essenes how to transform. What's fascinating about this is that in 2003, French physicist Jean-Pierre Luminet proposed that radiation left over from the Big Bang suggests that we live in a finite universe that is shaped 
like a dodecahedron and which resembles a video game or a hologram in certain respects. So here is modern science providing backup to Plato, the Essenes, and others. We're talking about the revelation of the matrix of Earth life, but we are also going beyond the veil as well and peering into the cosmos itself. As Leonardo said, learn how to see, realize how everything connects to everything else. The Essenes would absolutely concur with this. And the idea of the New Jerusalem is, is focused on that very concept. So we're going into the beyond the, the Essene veil here and looking at the, the, the prospect of a celestial city parked above Earth. The Essenes' idea about this 12-gated celestial city were picked up and repeated by John the Revelator, another Essene, in the book of Revelation. In Revelation, John describes this new Jerusalem as shining with the glory of God. Its radiance was like a most precious jewel, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The city had a great high wall with 12 gates inscribed with the name of the 12 tribes of Israel and 12 angels at the gates. There were three gates on the east, three on the north, three on the south, and so on. And at the center of this new Jerusalem was the tree of life that brought healing to the people and all the nations. Now, the thing is, is that John the Revelator was visited by an angel, arguably an extraterrestrial contact a close encounter of the fourth and fifth kind who came down out of heaven, says Revelation, clothed with a cloud and with a rainbow around his head who gave him a book to eat. Now, your traditional Christian preacher isn't going to say to you anything about this angel being an extraterrestrial and being in his rainbow body, but that's my take on it. I'm asking you to follow me in that perspective, that we're dealing with a, a manifestation of a celestial being here in his rainbow body who could then phase into a human form and handed a heavenly book to John who then consumed that book. He ate it. Now, whether or not this is some kind of a psychedelic substance that suddenly brought everything to life, we can absolutely argue that that is the case. The book is described as being bittersweet, but it tastes like honey. And when John ate it, he was instantly illumined. I have an opinion, based on my research, that it also assisted him in dissolving his flesh and blood body into his rainbow body of light, his celestial body as well. It for certain opened up his consciousness so that he could perceive this celestial city above Jerusalem. And he's not the only one. In 66 AD, Rome had enough of this nonsense about this spiritual, supernatural wackiness going on in Jerusalem. The, the Temple of Solomon was lighting up in the, during the day, these historians said. They would look into the stars, into the heavens during the day, and they would see celestial battles going on. So Nero, this idiot emperor, complete nutcase, sends Vespasian to Rome to decimate the, and sever this connection with the celestial realms. And as many as one million Jews were exterminated by the Romans in order to eliminate this teaching and take back control of the Temple of Solomon and close the portal that was linking Jerusalem and the Essene community at Qumran in particular with this celestial city. And that's what happened. And we didn't know a whole lot about this until 1947. You will certainly see references to the New Jerusalem as this cube-shaped space vehicle in Christian art in the intervening period. But we didn't have the backstory of where the Essenes were, were getting this knowledge, and especially about their belief that humans could transform preparatory to ascending to the celestial realm. It's interesting, 2015, hundreds of people in China in two different locations see a floating city in the sky, in the clouds, and they film it. 
Chinese TV news reports told how actually thousands of residents in two areas reported separately seeing a huge city form in the skies. Now, I don't know if this is some kind of hoax or, or what, but it sure is kind of very similar to what the Essenes were describing of the manifestation of this celestial city in the skies above Jerusalem. Let's talk for a moment in detail about the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were recovered from the caves near Qumran and are believed by most scholars to be the property of the Essenes. They tell us explicitly that the Essenes were dedicated to perfecting their bodies. That's their word, perfecting. For the past probably 10 years or so, I have used this word perfect as sort of a golden needle to thread my way through various spiritual traditions. And anytime I see it, I'm linking these traditions because almost every time I see the word perfect, it refers to human transformation into an ascended being. And here are the Essenes talking about this. It's astonishing. So they're dedicated to perfecting their bodies and souls in order to transform into angels close encounter of the ninth kind, and to dwell in the celestial city. Back up. Actually, the reason they wanted to become more angelic was to transform the entire planet into a planet of light and love. These aren't selfish cult members that say, oh, I don't want to be an angel. I want to be an ET. They realize they're doing this to transform the earth. And one of the, the benefits of that is that then they will be able to go on in their own spiral of evolution. This teaching, according to the scrolls, was given to the Essenes by otherworldly beings referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the holy angels of the Lord, or the watchers, and the Essenes were specialists in, the story, in creating stories about the watchers. And now we know from scholars that the watchers and the Anunnaki are like this. They're virtually interchangeable. So we are not going way out on a limb here to say that the angels that were living with the Essenes at Qumran and at their other compounds at Mount Carmel and in Alexandria and elsewhere were indeed the Anunnaki. This is Cave 4 at Qumran where the, the, one of the most important caches of the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. They caused a sensation in, in the world press when they were discovered in, in 1947. I mean, absolutely revelatory. Consider one of the, the, the greatest archeological discovery of the 20th century, which is saying a lot, because that means it's even greater than the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb and other discoveries. Immediately after they are discovered, they're sequestered. A little, a few fragments are put out, enough to, to get scholars writing hundreds of books throughout the early 1950s. But for the most part, the scrolls are mishandled, for one thing. They start to deteriorate, but also the scholars, greedy scholars, grab them and they sequester them away and they don't let other scholars have access to them. In the 70 years since, these scrolls have been just kind of gradually doled out, but the infighting among scholars, children behave better than these people. But what I've tried to do, not tried to, what I have been doing for the past number of years is scale those ivory towers where the scrolls are kept and where the scholars write in their private and exclusive journals to one another. Unless you have access to a a top university library, it's extremely difficult to get a hold of this material. Unfortunately, here in Nashville, where I live, I have access to the Vanderbilt University Divinity Library, which is one of the top divinity libraries in the world. And so I've been able to get ready access. I live five minutes from the library and have ready access to these materials and have been going up the ivory tower and getting these materials and then am now trying to bring it back down to the popular level. In early 2017, I will be publishing my findings in my book called Angels from the Celestial City, The Essenes and the New Heaven on Earth. And I will be sharing with you today uh, some of those findings in anticipation of, of that book coming out next year. 
one of the things that I uh, was am most intrigued by, and going back, this is uh, a depiction from Herculaneum that portrays one of the Essene therapeutae in Alexandria, Egypt. It's pretty assured now that the Essene movement was actually started by monks who came from India, disciples of the Buddha, who came to Alexandria, Egypt, and began working with the Jewish mystics there, as well as mystics from Persia, Iran, excuse me, Iraq, and also Egypt. So the Essenes actually, their origins are traced to India and the disciples of the Buddha. Now, the thing about this is, is that during the two centuries after Buddha's transition, Buddhism actually split into two schools or streams, Theravada and Mahayana. These are known as the great and small chariots or vehicles of enlightenment. The Essenes referred to these small chariots or vehicles of enlightenment as the Merkaba mysticism, throne chariot mysticism. They believed that our body was to become the chariot of the soul, that the soul would then ascend into the celestial realms upon. So here's the Buddhists already establishing the great and small chariot mysticism, Theravada and Mahayana Buddhism. Theravada from the Pali meaning Thera, meaning elders, and Vada meaning doctrine, is the doctrine of the elders or the way of the elders. These elders go way, 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 way back. People talk about a progenitor race in extraterrestrial conversations. They talk about the elder race. They talk about the shining ones. I believe we're talking about the same group. Theravada is the school of Buddhism that follows the original teachings of Buddha, known as the Pali Canon. They strive to become arhats, or perfected saints, there's our word perfect again, who have attained enlightenment, shining bodies, and nirvana. That's our goal, right there. That is the reason we are on earth, to transform earth into the kingdom of light, but also to perfect ourselves, attain enlightenment, shining bodies, and then ascend into the celestial realms. Mahayana Buddhism developed the idea that enlightenment can be achieved in only one lifetime, even by the lay person, not just by the monk sitting in a cave for 40 years or the nuns. Also known as the great vehicle, Mahayana Buddhists hope to become not arhats, but bodhisattvas, saints, perfected ones who have become enlightened but unselfishly delay their nirvana to help others attain it as well as the Buddha did. This is a fundamental precept in a lot of extraterrestrial discussions of why we're here, that we are part of a team that are sent here to transform the earth, and we won't leave until everyone who's gone before us has already left. Mahayana Buddhism often includes veneration of celestial beings, other Buddhas and bodhisattvas, ceremonies, religious rituals, magical rites, and in my particular interest is the use of icons and images and sacred objects as interfaces with the divine realm. Paramita, or perfection, or completeness, is a Pali term for the qualities that must be fulfilled by a bodhisattva during the course of their spiritual development. The Sanskrit word paramita means from beyond. In other words, from beyond the earth plane. This is a universal teaching. It's derived from para and eating, and ida rather meaning across, over, or beyond. It's what gets us across the great beyond, the veil of earth life, to go and dwell in the other supernatural realms, including nirvana, as mentioned a moment ago. The Essenes called themselves the house of the perfect ones. So this tells us right there in the Dead Sea Scrolls that they are perfectly aligned with this teaching and the celestial beings who brought this teaching to them. Paramita may, may also be translated perfect realization or reaching beyond limitation. In other words, it refers to the achievement of a transcendent state, which I believe is equatable with the Essene concept of the angels and the celestial beings. Obviously, we're not talking about the Anunnaki as flying around in chemical-powered rocket ships. We're talking about 
super advanced celestial beings. And personally, from doing research on the Anunnaki since 1991, I, I see how we got off track in thinking of them as just giant flesh and blood beings, when in reality, they're giant, meaning super advanced, super powered, celestial beings who can take on physical manifestation. One of the core teachings of the Bodhisattvas of, of Paramita is that there are six qualities that lead to realization, generosity, discipline, patience, joyful endeavor, meditative concentration, and wisdom awareness. Through the practice of these six paramitas, we cross over the sea of suffering to the th uh, shore of happiness and awakening. We cross from ignorance and delusion to enlightenment. We cross from flesh into celestial flesh. And in my opinion, that's the goal. That's what we're looking for here. That's the ultimate disclosure. While free energy devices and spaceships that prolong your suffering by preventing you from attaining your light body are really awesome, they are a sideshow compared to what we're really wanting to focus on, which is the attainment of our spiritual consciousness and our spiritual light body. Each of the six paramitas is an enlightened quality of the heart, a glorious virtue or attribute, the innate seed of perfect realization within us. And the paramitas are the very essence of our true nature. Practicing them today is as fruitful as it was 2,300 years ago, or even longer, out into the cosmos, where this is the universal teaching. The message here is that if you want to fly with the angels, the celestials and the bodhisattvas in the celestial realm, you have to live like one on earth. In 250 BC, King Asaka dispatched Buddhist monks and missionaries to Alexandria, Egypt, where they integrated with the philosophers and mystics of the great city of the philosophers, where the most astounding library of the ancient world was in existence. Among these missionaries from India were the Therapeutae, from the Pali term Therapeuta, literally son of the elder. And remember, I'm suggesting that the elders here are the elder race, the progenitor race. And we note that there's, their title, Therapeutae, is very close to Theravada, or doctrine of the elder. So they're clearly the same people. These mysterious Buddhist mystics who were known for their flowing white robes, established an embassy outside the walls of Alexandria on the shores of Lake uh, Moritis near Alexandria. Some scholars have suggested that the Therapeutae were descendants of uh, Asaka's Buddhist missionaries, and that seems pretty ironclad. It's without question that they heavily influenced the Essenes and early Christianity. So in Buddhism, when they talk about the pure land as a celestial realm of a Buddha, and as a Buddha field that's inhabited by many gods, extraterrestrial beings, humans, flowers, fruits, and adorned with wish-granting trees with rare birds. We're talking about the Pure Land tradition and that upon our enlightenment, we're able to enter into this celestial realm of perfection, this Pure Land. And even open-eye meditation such as this, this mandala, can tune our consciousness to that pure land and assist us in receiving downloads from these celestial beings. We find the exact same concept in Christianity, where now Christ is the enlightened one who dwells in the celestial realm with other perfected humans who have access to God's many mansions, other celestial worlds, even other star systems. So there's a direct crossover here between the Buddhist pure land tradition and the Christian tradition of Christ enthroned in the new Jerusalem or Sion as it's called. The empowerment or enlightenment teaching that was brought by the angels of the Lord, the Anunnaki, the watchers, is referred to in the Dead Sea Scrolls as the perfect way 
perfection of holiness, perfect holiness, or walking in the way of perfection. It was given to the Essenes by these otherworldly beings who were referred to as heavenly holy ones, sons of heaven, holy angels of the Lord, or perfect ones. These angels delivered the heavenly secret or the mystery that resulted in the transformation of their body into a supernatural substance or what is termed celestial flesh. The Essenes sought this bodily and spiritual perfection in order to cross over a veil or boundary to the celestial city and to commune with these beings, to stand united with them before God and to live in a perfect state called the perfect light for all eternity. That's the pure land of Buddhism. So here again, we see that crossover. And here we see the angel of revelation coming out of the celestial realms in his rainbow body, delivering to John the Revelator this mystery and trace these teachings back to Babylon and to the Anunnaki. And what I'm saying is that, once again, this mystery teaching that the Essenes received and utilized was about dissolving their body into their rainbow light body, glory body, resurrection body, ascension body, and then dwelling in the celestial realms. Now, here's the thing. You gotta go back in time a little bit. Let's go back to 1952, five years now. The scrolls have started to be talked about. This is the era of Elvis, the king of rock and roll. This is the era of Ike, battling the godless commies. This is the era of Billy Graham preaching Judgment Day. And suddenly, from out of the scrolls, leaps the teacher of righteousness, whom the Essenes called the Maskil, the enlightened one, who proclaimed that he's here to teach humans how to become angels? Uh, uh-uh. No, no, no. Those guys at the top table have already discussed this. We've been through the Roswell crash in 47. We're not letting this, this type of information out. Humans, Earth civilization is not ready for this kind of contact. And they're especially not ready to understand that this is the basis for Christianity. There's a whole other agenda here. They've got to protect the coming new world order, right? So you can't have this teaching about human perfection or translation into celestial beings coming online. Remember, 1947, the year in which the scrolls were discovered, is the very same year that Kenneth Arnold is flying in his private plane over the Cascades, and he sees a, a fleet of, as he described, boomerang-shaped craft skipping across the sky like a flying saucer. And the term is coined. And suddenly there's a frenzy. This is June 1947. July 1947, Roswell Army Air Force captures a flying saucer on a ranch in, in Roswell. Suddenly flying saucers are everywhere in human consciousness. Wait a minute. Where did the angels go? Where did the celestial light beings go? Why are we focused on these boomerang-shaped craft and crashes of, of hardware spaceships. Let's get back to, okay, we'll get back to that in a minute. 1951, you've got the day the Earth stood still. The flying saucers land on the Capitol Mall. That's followed up by Earth versus the flying saucers in 1956. The flying saucers being anchored in our consciousness. Extraterrestrials are robots. Extraterrestrials are flesh and blood beings. We've lost the original conception of them as these ephemeral light beings. Skeptics say there's a reason for this. That is that the atheist, godless, Soviet, commies, communist government officially promoted what's called paleocontact or ancient astronaut hypothesis during the Cold War of the late 1950s and 60s likely as a military psyop to torpedo religious faith in the Judeo-Christian West and torpedo this idea, especially the promise of Christianity, was that we can be transformed in the twinkling of an eye into a Christ-like being. 
Well, these godless commies aren't going to allow that. So they put a meme out there. They put a torpedo out there that says, you know, those biblical miracles and supernatural bullshit, all that crap, that's space aliens and hardware spaceships and nothing else. There is nothing spiritual going on in the cosmos. It's all hardware, big boys and girls and hardware spaceships, period. And, and to be honest with you, that idea is still kind of a, a precept of ancient astronaut theory, that there's nothing spiritual about this. It's just hardware spaceships. And the theory is, is that this, uh, the, the Soviets did this to cover up its own advanced spacecraft research. Now, how much of that paleo contact ancient alien hypothesis stuff JFK actually bought, we can't say. But there was a shift in American consciousness that, that began to happen in the 1960s. Star Trek, for example, is a somewhat quasi-militaristic view of advanced races in space. Most Star Trek episodes or stories are about the adventures of humans and aliens working together in something called Starfleet, a space-born humanitarian and peacekeeping armada that is part of the United Federation of Planets. Kirk and Spock go out into the cosmos and they have altruistic values, the prime directive, and they must apply these ideals to, to difficult dilemmas. But still back behind it is kind of this militaristic view. The enterprise is loaded with advanced weapons and it must defend itself in a cosmos that's teeming with alien life that wants to destroy us. Along comes in the 70s, Eric Von Donneken, who looks into K-Bar and says, look at these guys. These are alien beings. These ideas came actually from the Soviets, from the 1950s. They had already tilled the soil, looking at this cave art and saying, this is all extraterrestrials. Von Donneken looks at this incredible sarcophagus lid from the Temple of Inscriptions in uh, Palenque, Yucatan, and sees Lord Pakal and says, wait a minute, that is unmistakably and definitely Pakal in a Mercury rocket. And, you know, the thing is, is that you can absolutely see where the idea is in the, in the Mercury capsule, and you compare it with what you see on the lid of Pakal's sarcophagus, and you say, yeah, okay, I, 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 I can kind of see that. But then when you actually go back to what the Mayans said, this represented, you find that this is actually Pakal surrounded by celestial imagery. And he is actually on a throne and he is connected to what's called the sacred world tree. Maya scholars David Stewart and George Stewart interpret it more specifically as a shiny jeweled tree that represents fertility and wealth. And actually Pakal is resurrecting and ascending from the underworld into the afterlife. Now, here's the thing. And this is why this is so important for us to, to contemplate here. If you believe that we are going to ascend into the heavens in a Mercury rocket, then that is going to take you down a far different path than if you go one layer deeper and realize that this is a spiritual transformation that Pakal is undergoing here, and that he, in fact, is being portrayed in his journey into the Milky Way as an enlightened celestial being. In fact, this is an image of the Buddha under a similar shiny jeweled tree laid out horizontally that tells exactly the same story, spiritually speaking, metaphysically speaking, as Pakal's tomb. And you would never get the idea that the Buddha is ascending in a Mercury rocket. The point here is, is that you've got two pathways in this discovery of dis or this disclosure 
of these ancient connections with extraterrestrials. You're either going to go down the path that it's all hardware spaceships and nothing spiritual going on, or you're going to say, wait a minute, I, I think there, there could be more to this story than we've previously apprehended. Zachariah Sitchin is another who picked up the Soviet concept of paleo contact. Sitchin was, in fact, born in Russia and grew up in Israel and came to America. He's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City one day, and he looks at this incredible Nubian painting and says, wait a minute, that's a rocket ship. Here's a line drawing of the same image. And it absolutely, to the eyes of a person in the 1970s, would look like a Mercury rocket on a launch pad. The only problem is, is that Mr. Sitchin didn't, look beneath the cone-shaped object up on top that, re that resembles the Mercury command module. For if he had, he would see that underneath that cone-shaped object, that ascension vehicle, is the Egyptian symbol for the hope for the afterlife. And in no way, shape, or form did the ancient Egyptians ever say that our afterlife is going to be spent in a flying saucer cruising around the cosmos. Instead, they talked about the opening of portals or gateways in the belt star of Orion, where we would dwell as resurrected beings like Osiris. So the skeptics say that once the European and American authors had taken the Soviet bait and began citing the Soviet claims from the 1950s about alien rockets at Baalbek, astronauts in ancient rock art, or aliens in rocket ships, that the Soviet government just abruptly and conspicuously withdrew its support for the ancient astronaut theory. Beyond this, documentary evidence indicates that the Soviets and the CIA intentionally used the UFO flying saucers to bait one another, both to cover up their own activities and to try to gain information about the enemy's activities. What this leads to is recognition of a secret space program and a secret government. More, it leads to the revelation of a secret civilization, which is kind of the rage these days to talk about the U.S. government, Soviets, others, actually now Russia, being in space super advanced civilizations already out in space, having wars with other space civilizations. I'm not discounting the possibility of all of that. I just haven't seen personally enough evidence for that, but I am absolutely willing and have an open mind about that possibility. But personally, I want to know more about not spacecraft, but ascension craft. I want to know more about the spiritual implications of this, because I know that there are forces on this planet that do not want us to know anything about that aspect of extraterrestrial disclosure. As far back as 100 AD, historians like Pliny mysteriously claimed that the Essenes had existed for thousands of ages, hinting that the Essenes were part of a forgotten eternal race that exists outside of time. This may be the race referred to in the Apocryphon of John, a Gnostic text of secret teachings as the immovable race of perfect light humans, the immovable race, or simply the race. Undoubtedly, there are celestial beings out there that travel the stars in spacecraft. But undoubtedly as well, there are advanced civilizations that don't need a craft that recognize that our body itself is that craft. And this is the point of where the Essenes were coming from. Let me just follow uh, the, the, the Dead Sea Scroll timeline just for a moment because it's, it's highly instructive and informative of, of the nature of the information in the scrolls. In 1965 in Jerusalem, they built what's called the Shrine of the Book to house the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is at the Israel National Museum. The colors and shapes of the building were based on the imagery of one of the scrolls describing the war of the sons of light against the sons of darkness. 
the Essenes were dualists. They were the sons of light battling the incarnate sons of darkness who at that time were incarnate in the bodies of Rome, the Roman soldiers, the Roman Empire. And that Roman Empire then becomes the Nazi Empire. Then it becomes the current cabal, if you will, to use the, the current term. The white dome that we're looking at here symbolizes the sons of light and the black wall symbolizes the sons of darkness. Now, <laughs> right off the bat, you're gonna look at that and go, yeah, that looks like a flying saucer. It absolutely does, but that's not what it is. It in fact is one of the lids of the jars on which the scrolls, in which the scrolls were housed. Here's an interior view of that same lid and you see the, the Torah scroll there. So it's kind of interesting that it looks like a flying saucer, but it's not. There are actually three key pieces of art at the shrine of the book. You have the, the white lid of the jar that looks like the flying saucer, the black wall that symbolizes the sons of darkness. You've got this other installation there designed by Indian sculptor Anish Kapoor that looks very, very provocative as well. Let's look at the black wall just for a moment because it has brings up some very interesting associations in terms of the way they think about the scrolls. That black wall is very similar to the black stone of light in the meditation room of the UN. The UN of course is the globalist organization that seeks to eliminate all borders, even eliminate genders, and to create a unified human race that is dormant in terms of religion and spirituality that is then prepped to become a multi-planetary civilization. So here in the meditation room, we have this black stone cube that is sitting there in front of a piece of art by Bo Besco, who is the, the lover of Dag Hammarskjöld, who then in the 1950s, when this was installed, was the secretary general of the UN. Besco's painting portrays all the symbols of, of the world's religions. Dolly picked up on this black stone cube theme and incorporated it in his Corpus Hypercubicus, in which he shows the resurrected Christ transcending the sons of darkness, overcoming the black light, if you will, of the sons of darkness and going into the light. In 1968, you have Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 A Space Odyssey brought to the screen by Stanley Kubrick, where we see the Blackstone monolith as the stand-in for advanced extraterrestrial race. This monolith is perhaps one of the best cinematic solutions to the we don't want aliens to be dudes in flying saucers problem. I should say we don't want them to be dudes and dudettes in flying saucers problem. Stanley Kubrick, the director, and Arthur C. Clarke, the writer, wanted to make a film about man's relationship to the universe and was, in Clarke's words, determined to create a work of art which would arouse the emotions of wonder, awe, and even appropriate terror. The Stargate scene, of course, in 2001 A Space Odyssey was revolutionary. It's one of the reasons why Kubrick won an Academy Award for 2001 A Space Odyssey. But it anchored, once again, this idea of the black stone cube as symbolic of a gateway into the heavens. The very same cube turns up in Islamic mysticism, where it stands for the Kaaba, the most sacred black cube of Islam, where each year millions of Muslims make the Hajj to Mecca in order to circumnavigate the black cube. It also appears at the... World Trade Center Memorial in New York City. And it's now turned up in Arrival, a movie coming out in November 2016, starring Amy Adams and Jeremy Renner and Forrest Whitaker about an extraterrestrial invasion that features 12 black pod-shaped craft that suddenly manifest on Earth and Amy Adams is sent out to communicate with these guys and find out why they're here. Are they here for love or for peace? So my point is, is that this symbolism has some very interesting connections to be made 
not only cinematically, but also spiritually, what was the core of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Battle of the Sons of Light and the Sons of Darkness. The other significant piece of art at the Shrine of the Book in Israel, in Jerusalem, is Anish Kapoor's hourglass form here. Look at the curves of this and look at the mirror image. What we see is the reversal of sky and earth that relates to the spiritual importance of Jerusalem as seen in the concepts of the earthly and celestial heavenly Jerusalem. They're mirror images of one another. What I find so interesting about this particular sculpture is that the shape not only prompts this connection between earth and sky, heaven and earth, but it's also very distinctively wormhole shaped. And this is the other core concept in the Dead Sea Scrolls, this idea that Qumran, the, one of the communes of the Dead Sea, of the, of the Essenes, was a portal or gateway to the celestial Jerusalem or the celestial Sion. So this artwork has got the consciousness of the Essenes encoded or enfolded within it. As I said earlier, over half the Dead Sea Scrolls remained sequestered or hidden until 1941, 44 years after their discovery. Scholars kept this stuff under lock and key. And only, and not, not even scholars had access to it. And only in the mid 1990s did scholars begin to publish commentaries on the missing, what I call, Stargate Scrolls. I call it that because these hidden scrolls that were suddenly published reveal the Essene teachings about ascension. And you can see exactly why they were sequestered. Alien beings, celestial cities, human contact with extraterrestrials, human transformation into celestial beings. It's all in these scrolls. And the scholars that talk about it I, I just wonder what goes through, through their minds as they write in their private journals and write their PhD dissertations and so forth. Th these are literary dissertations in that they're dissecting the words of the Essenes, but they don't really capture the spirit of them. And as I delved into it, I was profoundly changed because the scrolls to me are an invitation from these advanced celestial beings to join them. The message is direct, specific, and clear. You can do this. You can get on this path of ascension and become an enlightened being and access the portals that link earth and heaven to these celestial realms. Call it the pure land, call it the new Jerusalem, you can access these other star systems. You have the ability to morph your body into light and then to travel through these other star systems and reclaim a physical body if that's your choice. I find it personally highly significant that in the early to mid-1990s when these Stargate scrolls were coming out, this is when we saw the movies Contact and Stargate hit the theaters. And once again, we've got uh, deception might be too strong a word because we are talking about movies after all, but in the movie Stargate, they resurrect an ancient device, a device through which a flesh and blood human can enter a portal, in this case filled with some kind of a watery transformational substance, and then travel across the cosmos. I loved the conception. The problem is is it goes completely against what the ancients said about Stargate travel. That the flesh and blood body isn't going anywhere. And by the way, neither are those stupid nuclear missiles that Kurt Russell, playing an Air Force commander in Stargate, took to another planet with them. It's not, it's not gonna happen in the, in the concept, the vernacular of the Essenes. These advanced celestial beings are not going to allow us to take our pea shooters and firecrackers into space with us. And again, this could be a very controversial subject for people who already tell us that the secret space program 
We're already engaged in wars out there with advanced weaponry. All I'm saying is that based on my understanding of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the understanding of, of their interaction with the, these advanced celestial beings, it's not going to happen. The flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's not going through the Stargate because the body is actually the Stargate. So as clever as the movie Stargate was, the Essenes had way won up this concept 2,200 years ago by telling us that, in fact, the human body is the Stargate, that we are meant to transform our body itself through loving actions into a being of light, and then we can join the advanced celestial beings out there. So again, let me be clear. I'm not trying to say that people who say there's a secret space program out there are wrong. What I'm trying to say is I would rather go this way than that way. Because ultimately, I believe that learning about the advanced capabilities of my soul and the human body is going to do me a lot better in the long run than trying to hitch a ride on a spacecraft. Talk about that in another presentation in more detail. Let's go back to the scrolls again. The Essenes believed that they were not only privileged to receive the divine mysteries, but that doing so would put them in the company of a family of angels. This one particular scroll tells how they were instructed in the laws and learned in wisdom, that they have heard the voice of majesty and have seen the angels of holiness. That's a close encounter of the third and fourth kind. They have seen the angels, the extraterrestrial beings of, of holiness. Angelomorphism and perfection is the term that's actually used by scholars to describe this close encounter of the fourth and fifth kind. It can be found in at least one important text in the scroll cache. It says, may you be as an angel of the presence in the abode of holiness to the glory of God. This is the greeting that the Essenes used to greet one another. We might say namaste. This acknowledges the divine spark within you and the divine spark within me. The Essenes would say, I hope you become a, an angel. I'll see you in the celestial realms, brother, sister. May he make you holy among his people and in eternal light to illumine the world with knowledge and to enlighten the face of the congregation with wisdom. For you are made holy. So this is telling us that they are being transformed. They are being made from one state to another state, transformed to illumine the world. Thou hast raised me to an everlasting height. You could readily interpret that in terms of an an abduction. I've been abducted by the angel and taken to heaven, either an everlasting height of consciousness or another place in the cosmos. Then the transformation, the close encounter of the ninth kind. Thou hast cleansed a perverse spirit of great sin that he may stand with the host of the holy ones, going to stand with the extraterrestrial angels that it may enter into the community with the congregation of the sons of heaven. In other words, join in membership with this celestial community. I was given a seat among the perfect forever, a mighty throne in the congregation of the gods. I have taken my seat in the congregation of the heavens. None find fault with me. I shall be reckoned with the gods and established in the holy congregation. The gods are the Anunnaki. The gods are the watcher angels. They are the advanced celestial beings. And the Essenes are saying, I shall be equal to those beings. This is why the Yonanaki came here. It has nothing to do with gold. That was, it was a total fabrication and imagination of Zechariah Sitchin. It served a purpose. But we know that actually the, the reason the Yonanaki came here was this to teach humans to become celestial beings. This is one reason why they were demonized, because cabal-type entities 
do not want humans to ascend with the angels. They want us focused on flying saucers, not transformation of our body into celestial beings. Again, nothing wrong with chasing flying saucers, but in my opinion, this is the direction that we want to go. We want to follow the saintly beings, the bodhisattvas. We want to become beings of light and love. I shall be reckoned with the gods and my glory with that of the king's son. In other words, we're going to be Christ-like beings according to the Essenes. These passages make it emphatically clear that the Essenes believe that they possess the secrets of God, the books. They learned wisdom. They heard the voice of these majestic beings. They saw angels or extraterrestrials. They lived with them, and they could be raised or translated to heaven and purified so that they could join these holy beings and enter into their company as sons of heaven in an otherworldly place called Sion, the New Jerusalem, the pure land of Buddhism. In fact, the purpose of the Essene community was to purify members in anticipation of joining the company of angels. And as I said a moment ago, this is the reason why the empire, the Roman empire, stepped in to eliminate this teaching. You can't have humans turning into celestial beings. They don't pay taxes, and they don't kowtow to some stupid emperor. They are members of a greater empire, and that's the point. So I believe that that uh, is going to be a really nice stopping point for us today as we look at Salvador Dali's beautiful painting of the ascension of Christ here. We'll conclude by saying that the Dead Sea Scrolls reveal, without a doubt, that the Essenes were having close encounters of the first, second, third, and fourth kind with extraterrestrial beings. But beyond that, the scrolls reveal that the, that the Essenes were having close encounters of the fourth kind, where they were taken into the heavenly realms, raised up to the everlasting height. Beyond that, they were having close encounters of the fifth kind, which involves direct communication between extraterrestrials and humans, a willing bilateral contact through conscious, voluntary, and proactive human-initiated cooperative communication and extraterrestrial intelligence. And having been altered or cleansed, the Essenes stand with these holy ones and the angels. They have become one of them. They can star walk in the angelic realm, and this is a close encounter of the eighth and ninth kind. Briefly then, finishing, close encounters of, of the third kind, of course, is the film in which we're introduced to this idea in Hynek's uh, concept in a mass way of the close encounter phenomena. We have the angels as extra terrestrial beings, gray like aliens that come out of the spaceship. And we have the leader teacher who is, seems to be a more advanced alien type of being. And finally, we're absolutely mesmerized by this idea of this massive mothership that takes us soaring into the cosmos. But again, from the Essene point of view, and again, for what it's worth, from the Essene point of view, this is not the craft. This is the interior of, of the craft. But that's not the craft we seek. The craft we seek is in the spiritual realm. We seek the portal of light, the gate of light, that ultimately transforms us into an ascended human, beyond human, a, a Christ-like being. And we join in the company of celestial beings, referred to in the book of human, excuse me, the book of Hebrews as just humans made perfect. And they're telling us that there is an advanced race of humans who have already completed this cycle of earthly evolution. And they dwell in the celestial city. 
the just humans made perfect, who are upright, righteous, in balance. They're still humans, but they're in an ephemeral form, and they were formed that way, and they are complete, whole, holy, and angelic. So with that, I'm going to uh, conclude this part of my presentation and open up the conversation now to any questions that, that you all might have. And before we do that, I want to thank you very much for your, your attention today. Thank you for uh, having me as part of this incredible program and uh, I'm just truly grateful for this experience. My website, if you want to follow up, is williamhenry.net. There you can find access to other video materials I have available on a flash drive. My wife, Claire, and I offer tours to, uh, we're going to England uh, later this month. We're going to Egypt in February of next year. We're going to be doing Italy and Scotland and Greece uh, in 2017 as well. And we invite you to join us on these spiritual adventures that take us deeper into these places of immense power around our world where secrets of ascension are ultimately housed.